Good day, Mike. First of all, thanks for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you live and work and what you currently do? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, happy to do this, Guy. I, I was really honored that you asked, so thank you, first of all. Um, so a couple of questions in there. Let, let's start with me. I'm Mike Kunkel. Anybody that wants to hunt me down, it's K-U-N-K-L-E. I spell it right. Um, I live in the Boston area now, in the suburbs in Bill Ricca. And I got my start, oddly, in the music profession, completely outside of what I'm doing today. I have two degrees in music from Mansfield University of Pennsylvania. And right out of college, I played professionally for two years. I played trombone and euphonium. And when I decided to hang that up for a variety of reasons, uh, I took an inside sales job near my hometown, right? So, and I was horrible, absolutely a, a horrible salesperson. But for some reason, the owner saw something in me and he kind of put me under his wing and he trained me, he coached me, all the things that, you know, we would, we would hope someone would do. And interestingly, the parallel for me is I applied almost everything I learned in the music profession, especially about the power of purposeful practice, which I drone on about a lot today. And eventually, I became their top salesperson. And I, you know, he, I was running that business for him for a few years, and he was sort of an absentee owner, which made him really happy. But I finally figured out you don't get promoted to owner. Right. So I jumped and I left uh, for a sales job in corporate America. And that year I outsold the five other people in that office combined. And they made the classic mistake. They promoted me to sales manager. But I had already done that for the small owner. So I used everything I learned about selling and training and coaching. And, and this guy actually a small business owner. He had all these systems in place to make his business hum. So I applied all that stuff at this corporate sales uh, manager gig, and I increased sales in that office 600% year over year. And I had a corporate recruiter one time tell me not to put that on my resume because it just sounded like a lie, right? But at that point, a, a really pivotal thing happened for my career. Um, they called me in and they, they asked me, did I think I could train other people to do what I had just done? And I lied right through my teeth, and I said, absolutely. And actually, it's, I, I actually really, I really wanted to get into training. It's what I secretly wanted to do. I had, been, uh, I had taken a Dale Carnegie course. I had joined Toastmasters, and I was, I was reading everything I possibly could. And so now looking back, I've spent 35 years in some odd blend of either the sales profession or sales training and development, which for me – eventually morphed into this whole sales performance consulting thing. And for the last 25 of that, I have uh, been on both sides of the fence. I've either been a corporate department leader, so you know all the titles, right? Sales training, sales effectiveness, sales performance development. We never know what we want to be when we grow up. Or I've been uh, an independent sales transformation consultant. So in all those roles, I always just considered that my job was to help companies figure out how do they drive dramatic revenue growth through best-in-class training strategies and eventually through sales transformation methods. And if there were one bane in my career, Guy, after all this time and all the fun and all the results, it would be how challenging it is sometimes to get the very people who are responsible for driving revenue growth to actually do the things that will drive revenue. But that's, uh, you know, that's been where I've, I've, I've had all my fun. And so I've been lucky that I've worked for some big companies like GE and McKesson. I've worked for a startup software provider where I was employee number 11. Um, I've gotten to develop courses for Richardson, which is a recognized top 20 sales training company. Um, I worked at Brainshark recently, which is a, a leading sales enablement software firm. And I've gotten to do work for clients like Intel, Cisco, and more, most recently LinkedIn, which I'm really proud of because LinkedIn has really been a big boon to uh, my career and a lot of other people. So it was really cool to do some work for them and see what a cool organization they were. Um, and I've done a lot of work for you know uh, mid-market firms. So, so that's me. And then you asked about some of the more interesting things I've worked on. So in terms of fun projects, 
Um, I once developed a, uh, after a needs analysis, of course, for all the front-end analysis people, we developed a, a three-week blended learning curriculum for sales onboarding, and it culminated after uh, all the distributed time people, you know, going through e-learning and reading and back then CD-ROMs and, uh, and talking with their managers and tape sets. I mean, we really mixed up the, the learning medium, but they did that. And we also had uh, uh, early WebEx at that time, so we touched base with people once, at least once a day so they didn't feel disconnected. But then they culminated in this four-and-a-half-day really intense thing that, that was well before I had ever heard the term flipped classroom. But that's exactly what it was. We had got all the knowledge into their heads. We, we helped them prepare for exercises and activities. We had tested them and had checkpoints and gating along the way. And if they lived through that two weeks, they came into this week in the classroom where we just worked their tails off simulating what they'd actually have to do on the job when they went back, moving from left to right through the sales process. And they had exercise activity, role plays, and we had feedback loops where they got feedback and then had to rework what they had done and actually apply that feedback right in the class. And that was the beauty for me of that whole flipped classroom is it was all hands-on stuff. And I have to admit, I got that idea from, um, from uh, attending a class called Criteria Reference Instruction by Bob Mager, where you brought your work into the class and you worked on it right there, right? So that was a ton of fun. And that program delivered just under $400 million in accretive revenue year over year, uh, which was recognized by the CFO and the president as attributed to, the, to our efforts and the work that we had done. And when I started there, it was a hard sell to build this program based on the five days of death by PowerPoint that <laughs> they were going through. But we sold the, we sold the concept as a, as a trial, and the president uh, had all of us sitting around a table at that point and said, look, I believe in uh, what you do and, you know, the, the woman who had brought us all in and, you know, and, what, and, and what your vision is. But let me be clear. If we're not sitting around this table a year later and we're not seeing a massive return for what we've invested, not all of us will be sitting here. <laughs> so that, that, those were our pretty clear marching orders. But we had incredible top-down support there and, and, uh, and really delivered. Um, and then earlier, I had delivered an onboarding program that was relatively similar, but we tracked it to see that we had people with 120 days on the job who were outperforming people, a control group that we set up, of people with five years of experience. That was a lot of fun, but it didn't necessarily make me popular with the people with five years of experience. But there was interesting learning in, in that one is that uh, this was really early for me. I developed this program. We rolled it out. Uh, we had these new people in class for two weeks straight after some time in the field preparing. Again, real flipped classroom, but we were still doing some teaching in there. But we actually put them on the phones talking to live customers uh, for a period of time near the end of this class. And I flipped my hat around from, from trainer to sales coach, and we sent them home with deals in motion. That was the first time I'd ever seen anybody do something like that. And that was fun, but an interesting thing happened. They left that class, and they shot off like a Mannheim rocket. And for, for viewers this way, I guess they went off like a rocket. But after that 120-day mark, they started to, to crest and actually performance started to decrease. And this is where I learned, and something that many of your listeners are, are, uh, probably already know, but it was early in my career, and I figured out, you know, we weren't teaching the managers what these, their new employees were learning. And there were no systems or reinforcement or coaching or things in place. So these people who we shot off like a rocket, started to be influenced and their behaviors changed to match what everybody else was doing and their guidance from their manager. And so this happened, and then we figured that out, and we put together what we called the Sales Skills Reinforcement Program, and we rolled it out across the country, and then we lifted the performance back up of those people, plus a whole bunch of other people in the middle of that bell curve and shifted behavior. So we had a tremendous amount of success and fun with that. And then just for a more recent project, I was just helping a client put in uh, an entire competency development framework in place with the goal of really creating an ongoing focus on closing competency gaps and then creating a learning and performance culture. And that was uh, definitely fun. So it's, it's been a really fun ride. Today, I'm, 
Uh, I'm the VP of Sales Enablement Services for two sister companies, SPA and SPA Sigma, um, where I'm doing a bunch of different stuff. I, I advise clients. I write. I get to speak at conferences. I develop and lead webinars. Um, uh, right now, we're delivering or developing a sales training course. I uh, got to deliver a workshop recently at a conference. So um, then I'm, I'm really trying to put together a client-focused sales performance system that if for someone who really wants to not just take training, but take training and implement it in a way to change behavior and drive results, that they can take the whole thing and just kind of like, boom, plug it in. So um, that's me in a nutshell, or as a friend of mine says, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I love the smell of measured results in the, in the morning. <laughs> Excuse yeah, me. I'll, that, mend, uh, I'll mend to that. That's yeah. So that's, the, those are that's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, yes, it's about measured results and uh, and uh, maintenance of performance is such a key factor that that's often neglected. I'm I'm so glad you brought that into uh, this recording. Uh, let's go back a little bit to. Can you share with us a little bit about your first exposure to what some call HPT, human performance technology, or, or however you refer to it? Well, I, I learned that as HPT, like, like most people who, uh, who get into it. And this was, I knew you were going to ask me this question, right? This was a real memory exercise. Um, so I figured out it was probably back, my first exposure, I think, was in 1990 when I was running a branch office for uh, HFC. And I had gotten really interested in hiring and training and coaching practices because remember that small business I talked about? Well, I, got all, I was the beneficiary of all this, this training and coaching. Um, and then I started to, to hire other people there, and I noticed how some of them came in, and when I trained them and coached them, they did exactly like I did, and they took off, and other people came in, I trained them and coached them, and they couldn't get out of their own way. So I got interested in the whole thing about you know, hiring really effectively being the first step of, of onboarding. So I was interested in all that, and so I joined ASTD at the time, which is now ATD, Association for Talent Development, and NSPI at the time, which is now ISPI, which your listeners probably know, International Society for Performance Improvement. And I wasn't in a position at the time, sadly, to, um, to attend the conferences, or we probably would have met uh, many, many years ago. Um, but I did, I did like, I was, I'm a big reader, so I devoured every performance improvement journal, uh, the PI quarterlies, which came out that I loved, uh, all the different magazines, training magazine and uh, TD uh, from, uh, from ATD. Um, and I'm, I'm reading all this stuff. And then I started reading all the books that were referenced in there. And, you know, some were at the local library and, you know, many uh, that I purchased from my own library. So, and wh what I did that was a ton of fun for me was I started planning. based on what I was reading, either the stuff in the books or stuff out on the job and incorporating it into what I did and measuring it to see, was it working? And if not, tried to figure out why not, talk to a couple of people, read a little bit more. And so it was that that really shaped my approach over time. So I am usually grateful for uh, my early exposure to ATD or uh, to HPT. And interestingly, um, that first job in corporate America, once, I, once they said, hey, could you train other people? And I said, sure. Uh, and I started really learning about that. It was really uh, a, a lucky experience for me that I got into an organization where they didn't really know that much about training. So they were willing to let me run on the way that I thought that it was supposed to happen. But they were really clear that I needed to measure and prove results for what I was doing. And so I just thought that's what the way it was everywhere, <laughs> right? And as I started to get wider exposure, I realized that I had had a lucky start um, because I, I started to meet more and more people who were just doing butts in seats counting or, uh, you know, not being able to truly, you know, do an analysis to figure out is stuff that they were just being asked to train. Should they even go bother to train that was training the solution to the problem? You know the drill, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was really fortunate to have that lucky start. And then found out that it, you know, wasn't the I was at, you know, a small end of the bell curve of people who were really approaching it that way. Yes. Well, so can you identify for our audience any of the 
particular people or mm-hmm. articles or books that uh, influenced you back then? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a relatively long list. So if you want, I'll also send you a bunch of names. You can if you po- you could post that up with the uh, with the video, like I know you do sometimes. Okay. But uh, I do have a couple of uh, of what I would call the real early influencers who 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 got me started. Um, and and by the way, these are all from articles and books. I have never met these people like like you have. So I'm really envious of of that with, with your experience. But Bob Meger was one. He was a big influence on me with uh, the famous six pack. And then I was lucky at uh, HFC where I worked, they actually uh, became certified internally to teach CRI. So I took criteria referenced instruction, um, I think in 93 or 94. And so that was a huge early influence, the six pack and CRI. Um, another one was Tom Gilbert, probably no surprise. Mm-hmm. I came I came across his book mentioned uh, at uh, NSPI or ISPI, uh, Human Competence, and then learned his six-box behavior engineering model and was starting to see uh, from all the other things I was being exposed to some of these common themes and threads that were, were weaving through these things. Um, I would give a huge nod to uh, Gary Rumler and uh, Alan Brosh in the White Space book. Um, And the systems thinking piece of that um, had a huge influence on me. Um, Don Clark, uh, not the the European Clark, but the American Clark Mm -hmm. and his big big dog website. Um, I ran across that thing. I mean, I started devouring that. And I could still, like, get lost for hours Mm -hmm. just, like, surfing pages on, on Don's website and poking around in that. And then probably the other early influence... Geez, there are so many, too, though, Guy. But um, the other one that stands out is probably Joe Harless. Uh, I don't own the book today. I don't remember whether it was a library book, where I came across it. But I read uh, Ounce of Analysis uh, at some point about his front-end analysis. And maybe Richard Swanson was another one. I can still picture the green book cover. And it's like the most dog-eared, highlighted book in my library with his book on analysis for improving performance. Because I kept trying to figure out how do I go figure this out better, uh, you know, before I start taking the toaster apart and trying to put it back together, right? Mm-hmm. How, do, how, do, how do I learn where to go poke to actually make a difference? And so those, those were probably the earliest ones. Uh, Rumler's thinking really got me started down the whole systems thinking path. And if I had to say one thing was probably the, the biggest influence in my uh, career, it was that influence on my ability to to change sales results and create sales transformation systems. So that's that's a big one. Um, the other thing I would add, uh, I haven't thought about this in years until um, I started thinking about this interview. Um, in 1997 or so, I came across a listserv discussion group. Remember listservs? Mm-hmm. It, it was uh, TRDevL run by Bill Rothwell and his grad students out of Penn State. And I had an absolute blast there. Um, I learned a lot. I made a lot of great connections. There were a lot of luminaries uh, who, who hung out on, on that and were sharing ideas. And so it was a little like a supercharged LinkedIn discussion group with so many power players from the space. And, um, and I, I was really sad when that whole thing ended. And I guess it's it's live it lives on in some form, but for me it was never the same as it was back in those those early days and all the discussions that we had there. So, and then you know there's a host of people who published in PI Journal and and you know PI Quarterly and some people whose names I could I could I was trying to remember a Tim. There's a guy's face I could see the picture. I read and loved <laughs> all of his articles, but I couldn't uh, I can't think of his name for the life of me. Tim Eskew. That's it. That's it, yes. Tim Eskew. Yeah, I loved his stuff. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much for all of that. That yes, there's a a lot of great people. I recognized uh, almost every name that you uh, mentioned. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, Rothwell as well, but I've heard his name in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but thank you for sharing all of that with us. Uh, let sure. me shift gears here just a bit here um, as an example for others. Can you share with us your 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do? 
Yeah, so anybody that knows me knows that I have a hard time doing anything in 30 <laughs> seconds. But um, I would say, so uh, at SPA and SPA Sigma, the sister companies I work for, we help companies improve sales effectiveness and drive profitable growth through the intelligent application of sales analytics, sales training, and sales enablement tools. And what I'm doing behind the scenes is helping build those uh, training courses, the sales enablement tools, how they get strung together to help clients find a way to improve their sales performance. Excellent. I didn't time that. that that's probably pretty close. Though. So congratulations on your first 30-second uh, elevator speech. Yeah, it took me two hours to prepare that. Thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. But that's yeah. but that's that's part of the point is that to hone your message down, the, the early uh, exchange it needs to be tight, concise, you know, it needs to, to communicate. And you really need to give some thought and effort to doing that and then practice delivering it. So, but, uh, so yeah. thank you uh, for that example for all of our viewers. As a lifelong learner, which I'm sure you haven't given any of that up yet, can you share with us a little bit about what your current or next focus for learning is? And are you writing, you know, writing anything in particular? But what can you share with us? So my focus has shifted a bit right now that I'm, I'm spending a lot more time on the vendor side. Either uh, recently I was, uh, I was a consultant on my own. Um, you know, now I'm working for SPA and SPA Sigma. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about demand generation and, uh, and how to take products to market more effectively. So I'm poking around in that and trying to learn more about that for myself. I, um, I was fortunate that at BrainShark, uh, they, uh, they had some really sharp demand generation pros there. Uh, and I learned a lot. I actually, for a while, reported to the marketing team, which is somewhat common but less so uh, than reporting to sales when you're in sales enablement. Um, so I'm learning a lot about that. I'm trying to learn more about digital marketing, uh, which is uh, brand, you know, not brand new because I've always been close to the marketing department. But it's all changed so much in the whole concepts of demand generation. So that's what I'm really learning on. Um, then in terms of what I'm, uh, what I'm working on, um, my, uh, my colleague Doug Wyatt at uh, SPA Sigma and I are, are co-developing a course that we call Modern Sales Foundations. And we're, we're focusing just on, as the title suggests, what are the foundational skills? And I think a lot about the Pareto principle, right? What are the 20% of the sales behaviors that we believe are producing 80% of the sales results from top producers? And so the course covers the entire customer life cycle. So it starts with, uh, you know, they don't know who you are and how you're going to prospect and do lead generation and, and create leads. How will you then manage them through the sales process and through the pipeline and do what's referred to as opportunity management. And then once you have an account, how do you, how do you logically assign account objectives? Is it a growth account, a maintenance account? You know, after a while, do you need to reactivate it or recover the account? You know, what's your objective with it? And how will you do strategic account management to, to achieve those objectives? And so across that customer life cycle, the common theme is a buyer-centric mindset in a value selling focus on understanding and delivering the outcomes that matter most to your buyers. And this is an interesting thing. And I see this guy um, in the training profession, uh, performance consulting. I see it in sales. And I don't quite, I've never quite wrapped my head around this. But if you think about it, Mac Hannon, H A N A N, for anyone who's into sales, he wrote a book called Consultative Selling. It's 49 years ago this year. If I had a dollar for every, every sales leader who has said to me in the past three years, we've got to move our people from selling transactionally to selling consultatively, I could just retire right now, mm -hmm. right? And 49 years later, we have still not made the shift to the complete buyer-centric, value-focused, ROI-producing type of, of customer-focused selling that that he wrote about 49 years ago. Uh, you look at our profession, right? We're thinking in terms of performance improvement, we could cite Megger and we could cite Rumler and we could cite Gilbert. And we could say, those guys wrote that stuff X number of years ago and yet we're still counting butts in seats or we're still doing training when training isn't the solution to the problem. I don't get the whole knowing doing gap. 
mm-hmm. uh, even though even though books have been written on it. But uh, for anyone who's listening to this who wants to get beyond it, you know the the stuff that we're talking about, the resources that have shaped both of our careers, those things are out there. All right, if, if you're in sales, the books and and things are out there that if you want to be on the far right side of the bell curve, there's a path to get there. And I think that's really important. So we're trying to create some of this in this course that we're developing. And um, so I'm going to I'm going to freak out a couple people in the profession and say the word micro learning. Right. But we're trying to create it in these bite sized modules of like eight to 18 minutes with that can either be self-contained or it can be strung together in a curriculum. And that way you can either use it as an onboarding solution uh, or you can use it to close identified competency gaps on an ongoing basis, right? And so, um, and then lastly, we're, we're doing the thing that we've talked about already. We're trying to build reinforcement elements for the program. And it's sometimes it's simple stuff like quizzes or flash drills that might, uh, might reinforce learning and foil the forgetting curve, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have virtual coaching challenges using a, a sales enablement tool, uh, downloadable job aids, manager toolkits to help managers know how to reinforce it. And um, I've always loved Harless's quote. I've seen you publish this, right? That inside every fat course is a thin job aid trying to get out, right? So we're trying, we're trying to do our best to keep that in mind and, and live up to that. And so I know that not every client's going to want an entire sales performance system, but we really want to make it available to anybody who wants it, um, who wants to truly transform uh, the behavior of their sales force and the results that, that, they deliver. So, and you know, I'm always poking around at a bunch of stuff, right? So I'm working on a sales performance assessment to help try to diagnose more effectively and determine gaps to close. Um, but all that's really taking a backseat right now to getting this course with Doug done. So that's, uh, that's my big focus right now. Thank you for sharing all that. It's, it's so true that much of this exists. We keep on, uh, or the business, the field, uh, reinvents it with a, under a new label and marketing the same old yep. stuff with a new name, hoping that that's going to sell and have an impact. And it's really the adherence and the rigor to which you embrace what's been known for a long time and put it in place and then maintain it, reinforce it much mm-hmm. as you're doing. But uh, that was a great example. I, I think of the, the way to approach things is to, you know, whether you call it chunking or micro learning, you know, there's, you know, just, just enough uh, to get the job done um, and be careful of overkill in the extreme with content. Um, yep. Too often that's the case. Uh, people don't know how to screen their content mm-hmm. by having a focus on the end results that you're striving for. Yeah. You know, to, you said chunk, right? So I, I can't, I can't tell you how many times the concept of chunk sequence layer, a simple concept has paid big dividends for me. And so everyone is clamoring about sales onboarding these days and how do you shorten the ramp up and improve sales results. And, you know, if you set performance milestones, where do you want people to be by when? Mm -hmm. And you you have the fist fights because it almost always takes an argument because someone wants to do DocuSign in the first week and they don't need DocuSign until, you know, six months from now, right? But if you you figure out what's the need to know content, Mm -hmm to get them to that first milestone and teach that and then get them there. And then, then what's the need to know content to get the next and you chunk sequence and layer that bam, all of a sudden you have ha- you, you've cut your onboarding time in half and they're performing at twice the level that they were previously. It's, it's not rocket science, but I just don't see a lot of people doing it. It's true. I don't think many people do it. It's uh, and it's a wonder. Uh, let me shift gears again here on you and, my question is, is there a favorite HBT or mm. systems thinking or sales term or phrase that you would like to define for us? I, I offer this opportunity to people because perhaps they're annoyed with how the world is using some term or phrase and they would like to uh, put their spin on that. What do you have for us? Yeah, I could I could probably rant on a couple of things, but the one that I'll one that I'll mention because we've talked about HPT uh, is I do wish that we would just drop the T in HPT, right? I get the intent, I always have, 
Right. But today, especially with as much as technology is flying around us and, and advancing, I think calling it a technology is a misnomer, in my opinion. And I think it's confusing to a lot of the people who might otherwise gravitate toward it. Um, and if you think about the entire body of work, uh, there's a focus on behavior and performance being a function of the person and the environment, right? So I've wondered for a while if HPT ought not be something more like OPI, right? Organizational Performance Improvement. Now, I'm, I'm not vested enough in that to go wrestle anyone to the ground, but, you know, I have, I have, I have wondered about it. And uh, I'm, you know, I, I swore that I wasn't going to mention the dreaded learning styles, but if we can't beat this thing into submission this year, I may retire, right? Because there's, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's so many, so much stuff like that that just won't die. Um, and then I guess, the, the, so the other thing, there's a, fun, there's a term that I'm fond of that's, uh, that probably will never catch fire, right? But I use a lot as sales performance levers or just performance levers. Mm -hmm. And I, I define a performance lever. It's, it's the critical competencies, knowledge, skills, behaviors, or conditions, the environment, which must be present for ethical, sustained, high levels of performance to occur. Now, it's hard to reach that unless you're really trying to do it purposefully, right? And I think there are, level, uh, there are levers, and this goes back to a ton of the work of the people before me, right? But there are levers at the task, at the role, at the function, and the organization level. And if you can get those in alignment, holy cow, your organization will perform at the highest possible level given, you know, all the macro and microeconomic conditions that it's functioning in. But um, – like maybe that's more OD work. I don't know, but uh, I've always been fascinated by that. And when you can get the top-down support to make it work, um, you can really move the needle if you start getting those performance levers uh, in alignment. So uh, that'd be one that I'd like to see more of us talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all of those. Yes, the whole HPT, there's been uh, questions about the T. There's questions about the H. You know, the Danny Langdon famously said, you know, get the H out. Um, but uh, so many have gravitated to performance improvement or now there's evidence-based practices for performance improvement. So many different names. And as uh, somebody that I did an interview with yesterday said when, when he was asked, you know, what do you want to call? And it was the Gilbert's behavior engineering model. He said to the, to the head salesperson at a big company, he said, what do you want to call it? He didn't name it. He refused to give it the name that it had that it already existed for it. He just said, what do you want to call it? Because then it would make sense to you, his customer at that point, uh, yeah. which was, uh, you know, the person was embracing it. And uh, he mentioned, and I agreed with him that uh, we too often we use our language instead of speaking the language of our customers. So if we can get our customers to begin to name some of these concepts and tools so that it makes sense to them, it's more likely to make sense to the other people in their niche, in their neck of the woods. Uh, but so, yep. so thank you for, and, and yeah, learning styles, I don't know, uh, you know, at one point I believed in learning styles and I was disabused of that back in 1985 because I made my first national presentation using that in one of my slides and people came up to me afterwards and uh, quickly set me straight, which, which was a good thing. Um, yep. As kind of a wrap to our interview here, I'd like to, again, take you back to some of perhaps your early days with HPT or you know, human performance, evidence-based practices, systems thinking, and, and do you have some stories that you can share with us uh, uh, that might uh, carry some meaning for our uh, audience? I hope so. I, the thing that uh, that jumps out at me is was Rumler's quote about pitting a good performer against a bad system and the system winning almost every time. Um, for some reason, that like hit me right in the face when when I heard that. It was the other one is the Zig Ziglar quote, completely different, but that you get what you want in life by helping enough other people get what they want. That was one of those things when I heard both of those quotes. It was like. Bam, those were aha moments and stopped me dead in my tracks. And so the Rumler thing, right, that, that, that really got me thinking about creating the right environment, of course, behavioral engineering model, right, um, defining roles, putting the right people in the right roles, and later uh, Collins would say right people in the right seats on the bus, right? Um, that's a, a famous quote. It's establishing the process and methodology, 
doing it based on what your customer is doing as opposed to doing it uh, inside out in a vacuum and then building the training, coaching, and other support systems and sales management systems to really get a sales force performing at its highest level. And again, for me, it's all sales all the time, right? So I'm thinking about it mm-hmm. that way. So based on that work, I started, I started thinking through all these systems and moving parts. And man, there are, in, in an organization, there are so many. But I start, I always think, again, 80-20, right? What's the 20% of stuff I could focus on that would get me 80% of the results? Because trying to take an academic approach into a sales organization is like trying to push an elephant through a keyhole, right? So I've, I've sort of nailed it down over the years to a sales selection system. How do you make sure you're putting the right person in that right role? How do you create a, an environment and a support system for them? Right with the right tools and processes and methodologies and teaching them, giving them the business acumen and financial acumen that they need to have real business conversations rather than go pitch products. Um, how, do you, how do you give them an understanding of the market that you're serving and those buyers and how your customers' businesses operate and how you can support them and giving those, those things? A sales learning system so that you're, you're starting with the right content in the center because it doesn't matter how good you do the rest of it. If the stuff you're teaching won't produce a result in the real world, you're dead in the water anyway. But then how do you, how do you design learning in an effective way? How do you get the managers engaged? How do you go through what I call the five stages of sales mastery and behavior change? You acquire the knowledge. You, you reinforce and sustain that. You give them an opportunity to practice skills and get feedback and repractice rather than practicing on the customer. How do you create a plan to purposely transfer then what was learned in the learning environment to the real world? And since it's not likely that the first time they do it, they've done it really well or they're going to continue to do it without some, some nudging, how do you guide and coach them over time, whether it's through workflow performance support, whether it's through coaching from managers or others? How do you get it to be the way we do things around here, which is my favorite definition of culture. And so I created these systems of selection, sales support, sales learning, and sales management in the times that I have actually been able to sell that concept and get it implemented. The results weren't 11% year over year. It was like 400% year over year. Um, And so it's that systems thinking piece that has probably done the biggest. And then the other thing that's dawned on me is that uh, I've, over the years is that we're so insular and inside out. And so what I've started to do is really flip the script to start with the market and buyers in mind and added sort of a buyer centric or buyer oriented foundation on which all of the other systems are built to be sure that what you're building is serving the buyer, which is that back to that Zig Ziglar thing, right? You get what you want if you help enough other people get what they want. And those two quotes kind of converge then, um, in my work. And, um, the other thing that I, I've sort of taken away from all of these experiences is the power of top-down support. Because in one of the projects that I shared earlier where we just, we just crushed it, we had top-down support straight from the CEO and president and CFO. And we worked with the CFO. Um, you know, and I'm going to say something that will upset some people, but all training evaluation is a lie to some degree, right? What it is, it, you have to get together and agree on the lies you're going to believe, right? Because a- attribution is so difficult. Was it, you know, in month three, was it the marketing program? Was it the price reduction or, or was it the training that, that lifted that result? But if you, if you look at what you're doing in every given month and you get the right players together, you can do your best to at least figure out. If we're seeing a lift in that month that is different than the trend line up to that point, what are, what, how are we going to attribute that lift based on all the things that we're working and, and, and pushing on performance that month? And that's what we did at this company. Um, and we, you know, we, we came out at the end with something that was pretty logical, but we came at it, the same, same concept that uh, your friend talked about, because they bought into it because they helped to build it. And you know, when the CFO helped build it, and we reported back to him exactly the way that we said we were, it's very difficult for him to argue with the fact that we had, you know, we had lifted performance. We had marketing in the room and we had the training team in the room and we had the sales leaders in the room and, you know, uh, the product management people in the room. And then, you know, when we looked at all of these various factors now, Hey, oh, heck, all the work that we did to do that, we probably reduced the ROI by 20% just trying to figure <laughs> out what, 
what the ROI was, right? So I think there has to be a balance mm-hmm. on, on that sort of thing. But the thing that made that work was the incredible amount of top-down support. And it, we weren't given carte blanche, of course, right? But the support that we got was public inside the organization and phenomenal. And at one point, the frontline sales managers were required to get certified in both our sales methodology, what we were teaching their people, and our coaching methodology, which is how they were going to work with them. And this was a process over time. And if somebody failed initially, and the, the key to a good certification process is that if you don't have people failing, you're not certifying anything, right? So we had people fail, but you know they weren't just booted out. They had other chances to get there, and there were it was remediation work and support. But if you couldn't get certified eventually, you could not work there as a manager. And I I don't know that I've seen that kind of top down support in many other places. Um, and oddly about this place though, guy, is it it may have been the only place that that message wasn't needed. Because these managers really wanted to do a great job. They were really, they wanted to support their reps better. Uh, but I, I wish many times over my career that I had that kind of top-down support in every company or in every engagement. Because I, I think you can still make an impact with a groundswell or a grassroots initiative. But let's not kid ourselves, right? Systems work, real culture change, uh, all the stuff that we do goes so much more smoothly and can produce so much better results if it's really an organizational initiative from the from the top down. And uh, I remember a story uh, from some friends at Marriott that always made me laugh. Right? He said Bill Marriott decided that he wanted to pursue a serious quality initiative. Now we all know how that turned out, right? But uh, he had his second in command apparently call up Malcolm Baldridge. Right? And according to the story, as it was told to me, Baldridge said. I'd be absolutely happy to help as soon as Bill Marriott calls me personally and he hung up the phone, mm-hmm. right? And the rest is history. Bill Marriott called him, you know, and now, you know, they're, they're a Baldridge Award winner. And, you know, but the lesson from that story is one that I, I never forgot. And I've seen that play out um, a ton of times in, in my career. You, uh, and earlier, before we start, hit the record button on this, you mentioned, uh, a person that uh, has been influential with you, mentoring you, you've never met them live, just like you and I have never met live, but you right. mentioned uh, uh, how you've interacted with Dave Stein. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, Dave, uh, Dave and I met, I don't know how many years ago now, in a LinkedIn group of all places, right, which at one point were uh, so much more interactive and engaging and less of a link link farm than they are today. But uh, we were in there talking about various sales enablement, sales training, sales performance initiatives, and we found ourselves saying the same stuff. So then we started to reference each other, and all of a sudden we were emailing and we're connected on LinkedIn, and then we started talking on the telephone. And like you said, Dave and I have never been in the same room at the same time. But over my career, he has been an absolutely phenomenal mentor for me, and um, he retired. Uh, but he uh, he did get to do an interesting thing with me once. So uh, I was working for a company where I was trying to sell this concept of the whole systems approach and doing a top producer analysis the right way. And they said, "Well, how do the CEO? I guess said to my boss, how do we know this is going to work if we invest in all this? Is there any any backup for?" this kind of thing, anybody that can vouch for it. And Dave Stein was running a company called ES Research, which was sort of like the consumer reports uh, for sales training and uh, you know sales performance or effectiveness companies. And so I said, well, you could always talk to Dave Stein. He could review it and tell you, you know, this is what Dave does, and here's his company, and here are the reports he produces on these sales training and sales effectiveness companies for buyers. And so they hired Dave and Dave reviewed my work. And um, we probably got closer even after that because he saw that what I was doing, what he believed in were so in sync. And he actually gave me some great feedback then. Um, And then that's, I think, probably where the whole mentoring thing began. And I don't know if you asked Dave if he'd actually say he was my mentor. We never formally, you know, had anything in place. Um, But he was one of those few people that I felt I could reach out to for uh, and be completely authentic and get authentic advice on things that were sometimes, you know, professional and sometimes had more of a personal nature, but, you know, about work-related stuff. And um, 
you know, he shaped my career in so many positive ways. And again, never been in the same room at the same time. So that was uh, he was he was a big one for me. Yes, we live in uh, such a virtual world nowadays. Uh, um, it's an important lesson that uh, we need to establish those kinds of networks. If if they're not uh, geographically possible to establish a face to face kind of a relationship, um, we need to learn how to use the technology uh, in today's world. Mike, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview with me. Um, I really appreciate it, and I look forward to following you uh, uh, additionally on LinkedIn and uh, out there on social media. Um, thanks. Have a great day. Cheers. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. You have a great day, too. <laughs>